Three, two, one, and you are now live. Brilliant. Thank you, Ash. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this evening's FBS chat. Uh, really, really pleased to have Mark McCurgo with us this evening. And uh, Andrew, my co-host, thank you for joining us, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> and I know, Mark, loads of papers you've written, books, and I always kind of really curious as how how our guests came across the approach in the first place what what resonated with you with it thank you well that's great to be with you everyone thanks so much for the invitation uh, i was hoping you were going to ask me that um <laughs> because i've got a 59 minute story about that wow <laughs> <laughs> now, so here's the thing. I, I came into solution focus from management and management consultancy and I got into management consultancy out of nuclear reactor physics, which is a whole other story. And we are, so that's where Jenny and I met in the nuclear power industry. And we were, it was around the time of privatization. Very old people watching may remember electricity privatization nearly 30 years ago, in fact, more than 30 years ago. And in our part of the electricity industry, we were having a culture change program imposed on us by consultants. And I got involved in this thing because I was interested in facilitating and interested in kind of organizational change. And I was doing an MBA degree in my spare time with the Open University at the time, just as they'd started doing it. And I was very, very dissatisfied with the way that this program was run because it, they told us that we had to change our culture, but they didn't tell us to what. They told okay. us that, that, that there was nothing active we could do to tell people to change culture. It had to come naturally. And they told us that only they would know when the culture had changed. And th th these were very, very expensive consultants. And mm. I thought, well, blow me. If that's what being an independent, uh, an expensive consultant's like, I can do better than that. <laughs> and so I came out, I, I left the nuclear industry in 1992, and I was looking around for things to, you know, interesting things about organizational change. And, uh, I went to a, a workshop with James Wilk in London, and Wilk was um, not a solution-focused therapist. He was a brief therapist, and he worked with Bill O'Hanlon in the late 80s. And, uh, and he introduced me to his work, which is not solution-focused, but it's kind of strategic therapy for organizations. And it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen before, and I thought, ooh, this is interesting. Mm. And I, I read his book on holiday, and came back with it all covered in pencil markings. Yes, 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 underline, underline, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Uh, and I think I must, this is, this is something really interesting. I must find out more about this. So I connected with Brief and mm. went to some workshops that they were running and just got hooked almost immediately on this solution focused thing. Uh, and uh, because in solution focus, of course, you can't change unless you know to what. And you yep. can't change unless you can work out whether you're changing or not. Uh, and the client gets to notice, not the consultant or the professional. Mm. Uh, and, and the whole idea is you can do something right now, behaviorally, that will begin to help. Mm. Uh, and um, I was researching sort of the early days of the precursors of Solution Focus for this book I'm writing, or I've written, it's with the publishers now called The Next Generation of Solution Focus Practice. And this goes all the way back to the origins of the brief therapy movement in the 1960s, where the Mental Research Institute people who were doing sort of problem-focused brief therapy, but they had this, this presupposition that you can do something behaviorally right now that will help if only we can figure out what it is. Mm. Uh, and that, that turns out to be a pivotal piece in our work because it says that the client can do something in principle uh, and um, it's not, and, and, and the client will notice the difference. Mm. Now, they, in those days, they were trying to do things like, like interrupt the problem pattern, which we don't do anymore. But nonetheless, they had this idea that the client could do something to change their interaction with the people around them that will help. And that's the thing we're looking for. And that, of course, is a big difference to the kind of psychoanalytic traditions, which are much more like the consultants I hated so much, which is that you, you can't do anything right now until you have sort of gone, gone this internal 
insight process and only the professional can tell you when you've done that uh, and, and and you can't begin to see any change until you have sort of crossed this invisible barrier mm. um, and so the whole thing is quicker it's more empowering it's more engaging uh, it's more pleasant and the client's in charge and yeah. the client has to trust their own judgment, not that of the professionals. So this is a really long answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I apologize for that. But it, the whole spirit of it, just it resonated because, I think, of this awful experience I'd had with these other consultants mm -hmm. uh, who were working in, I have no idea what their method of working was. They refused to tell it to us, which was part <laughs> of it. was a well, secret. I, Yes, yeah, the same thing. I think they've been trained in tea groups or something, and, and the, their job was to disrupt anything we were trying to do in order to create something else. But um, it was a deeply frustrating experience. And I thought, when I'm a consultant, I'm not going to do it like that. I want to do something different. And Solution Focus appeared on the radar. And for me, it was that different thing. And I, that, that's it. If only consultants and coaches and organizational managers had could get their hands on solution focused ideas, they could really do some good. Mm. And that's, that turned into my life for the next 30 years. So, so I'm, um, I'm, I, I work in the same world, Mark, and, and come up against all these consultants who love to overcomplicate things, principally for their own benefit and for their mm. own application of their own fat fees. Um, when, you, when you discovered solution focused practice, you were, you were one of the first, if not the first, to take it into this organization development management consultancy approach. How did you find it was received when you first started going out there on your own, trying to find clients and introduce them in this method where you were not the expert in their business? Well, there's a thing called the thing about process consulting. The tradition of process consulting goes back further than me. And this is where the, the consultant is more like a coach asking questions. Um, the thing was that the original process consulting book um, by people like Ed Schein um, were, were problem focused. And so you had to, the idea was that the client didn't know what their problems were until you came and asked them questions about them. And of course, that's not the tack that we take, but the, the stance is the tack. So solution focused process consulting. And pe people, I think, understood process consulting, but they hadn't seen a solution-focused version of it. And there is also a thing in the organizational field, and I think maybe other fields too, where you need a bit of hook draft, as, as, they, as they say, uh, in order to get some engagement. And it's something I've always grappled with a bit. You have to, you have to turn up looking like somebody who knows something. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> And then very little reason for you for them to talk to you. And the best way to turn up looking like you know something is to have great recommendations from other people. Um, and then you get listened to. But but you I you cannot wander in. I cannot imagine Steve DeShazer being a good organizational consultant because his demeanor was bad. Um, he was a genius. He was a genius. I am thrilled to have known that man. He has changed my life and so many others. But it, you have to have a bit of sort of engagement and and coherence, at least at some level. To look as if you know what you're doing. So when you ask the question, you've got to ask it in a way that look makes it look important and interesting and relevant uh, and, and the vital thing that we address right now. And uh, on a on a good day, certainly um, people people really like that. Uh, because you, you feel you feel the difference. I think the other thing I like mm. about it, you feel the difference right there in the moment. Mm. Um, and so you can, uh, completely unlike the other consultants I was talking about at the beginning, you know, people sort of start to feel feel the energy coming. I don't use that in a kind of hippie way. It's sort of mm. Empowering, engaging thing that, that, that comes. And um, so when you're asking the question, people are always thinking, oh, just a minute, there's something interesting happening, something useful happening. Mm -hmm. When I was working with Paul V. Jackson, who I know you had on the guest a few weeks ago, we used to always have a little exercise near the start of our training called Problem Talk, Solution Talk. And we had a list of problem-focused questions and a list of solution-focused questions, and people had two minutes each 
on it. Mm. And you have to say, where, what's the difference at the end of the second round? Mm. As opposed to the first round, the people felt completely different about their problem or their issue after only two minutes of question. Uh, and I think that's really significant. There's a sort of different way of engaging with the whole thing, which you can, it's not a matter of an hour or, or six sessions. It's a matter of you can start to feel it in two minutes, which mm. is quite astonishing. Yeah. <clears throat> it must have been really important to, to get that feeling from the start, because I guess you've got this... Um, You've got one. You've got some of the people that would think, "Well, who's this guy coming in?" He, he, you know, we know our industry better than he ever will. Or, or uh, the management who've gone, "Bloody hell, we've paid all this money for this guy to come in and tell us what to do." And he's asking us, "Well, well what, what do you think you should do?" <laughs> well, I don't. Of course, you don't say that. That's the yeah, rest yeah, of the yeah. Word. Yeah, yeah. You don't. Say, you know, yeah. so you say that at the end of the day. You know, with five minutes to go in the day, not before then. Um, <laughs> But, but so I was the, uh, an expert, if you like, or experienced in organizational development and um, particularly in learning. Uh, and we also had some very good ways of engaging people in trainings. So I used always a practitioner as, as well of accelerated learning methods, brain friendly learning methods, which is a whole other thing. Uh, but where you use lots of different ways of learning and you keep variety and you keep people doing things. You know, you don't have them sitting for very long. You get them up and doing things and moving about, talking to each other and reflecting on stuff and, you know, having lots of quick activities um, uh, that, that really... Uh, and when you run workshops in that style, they're engaging anyway because you're looking... You're a bit different to the normal kind of chalk and talk or PowerPoint and mm. power, laser pointer we have these days um, <laughs> method of engaging with people. And so they like that anyway. They like the way that we worked with them because it was quite fun and it was quite colourful. And we always had a bit of music in the room in the breaks and juggling balls to play around with and, you know, nice colourful posters on the walls and lots of interesting things to do in the workshop. And that also helped. Mm. But, but the real reason that I liked it, though, was that it, for the reasons that Andrew was saying, that it was that they were doing the work to help themselves, and I was kind of showing them how to do it. Um, uh, and we were showing them a different way to that you've got to pay people a lot of money to tell you what to do. We we're saying that for actually much less money, we weren't terribly cheap, but you didn't have to have us for very long to start making a difference. So a day or two, we can do quite a lot. We can help you with your issue your challenge, your project, you know, at, at quite, in quite a sort of deep, sophisticated way, whereas the other lot would take at least a month to, to uh, you know, to do their way of coming in and trying to survey everything and, and understand it all. And we don't need to understand it because the client will understands it already, <laughs> even better than we after a whole month of looking at it. And so there's a kind of real difference between the McKinsey type way of working which is about gathering facts and the solution focused way of working which is engaging with people it's very different mm. and, and of course the the outcomes as you say are very different because if the client is making the changes on their terms then the change are more likely to be sustainable change so mm. there's, there's huge advantages in the long term as well so um mm. You mentioned there about the writing of this wonderful book. I have my my very well thumbed copy here, um, which you wrote with Paul Z. Jackson. Um, indeed, indeed. Um, and it is it is a fantastic book. I've read it many times. I've gifted it to many people. Indeed, I was very pleased to see it. A friend of mine used to work for Unilever. He was very senior. He was based in Singapore, and there on his bookshelves when I visited him once a few years ago was a very copy of that book, which prompted a great conversation for, for him and I in, in having solution focused in common. Um, so we'd like to tell us the story, because I believe this was the first time somebody had written, that, that, that anybody had written a book on solution focused practice for organizations and to apply it to organizations. So mm -hmm. can you tell us how this came about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was working with Paul Z. Jackson, and we were um, we were working on these accelerated learning workshops to start with. And then um, I discovered SF, and I shared that 
with him very early on. And uh, he, he was a journalist in a former life and could write, uh, whereas I was a scientist and so could write, but in a very strange way. And uh, uh, so, so we thought, well, let's, write, let's try and write a book on this. And it was very interesting because we, um, we set out to write a business book explicitly, which is different from all the other SF books to that point. Um, but we then also found that we had to rethink what SF practice was about. Because when you've got a, a sort of client and a therapist or a helper and a helped, you've got a sort of power relationship already there. Uh, where the, 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 the therapist gets to ask questions and, 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 and the client gets to answer them. But management isn't always like that. There's all sorts of different relationships you can have in an organisational setting. You can be a manager with a, with a, a worker. You can be a group of colleagues. Uh, you can be in a cross-disciplinary you know, project group. You can be a consultant. You could be a coach, and coaching was kind of getting going at that stage in the organisational sphere. And so we thought you, you can't simply define it as a set of questions. Mm. Uh, so we went to the bigger chunk of work than that. We had our six solutions tools at that point, which is the sort of heart of that book, which were six kind of topics of conversation, um, which if you strung them together made solution focus. So uh, there's the, the building the platform, which is like the, the you know the contract and the best hopes and all that. And there's kind of what, what are we talking about? What's the platform? Uh, the future perfect, which is the miracle question and everything that goes around that in terms of building that that picture of day after the miracle. The counters, which is a, I would not call that now, but it's um, uh, to do with what counts. In other words, what's working. Uh, and a very broad sense of not just what's working, but useful qualities, grounds for optimism, etc. So that's the third one. Then we had the scale, of course. Then we had the affirm tool, which is kind of more like complementing and uh, spotting resources and strengths at work. And finally, the small action tool, little things to do next. And so rather than define questions, we define these tools. And then, of course, within each tool, there's a set of possible questions. Uh, and um, and the way that you develop them in conversation, and and so in a in a way it was a kind of it was a new look already, a little bit of a new look. You'd recognise it as solution focus, but it's a but it's getting away from the you know helper helpy into a whole range of other settings. Mm. These things could be used, mm. Brilliant. and it's been it's been. <laughs> Thirty thousand copies, which is and it still sells now. It still sells as many every year as it ever did, which I'm very pleased about. And uh, you know, these things are you don't write them for the money. I'll tell you, mm. <laughs> you know, you make a, a little tiny bit on each one of those. But the more the more encouraging thing is, people are still buying it because I think mm. it's a good. I think it's very well written. A lot of that's down to Paul, um, uh, uh, but it's its message clearly still resonates twenty years after it was. It was published, and I'm I'm really thrilled to have something like that uh, on my you know mm. on my shelf and still out there. Is there, is there any um, any sort of piece of work or company in particular that stands out for you, Mark? <laughs> well, ah, gosh, I mean, we did one thing we did, which I was very pleased with. We did several bits of work with a semiconductor company. I don't know whether Jenny talked about this when she was on the show uh, a few weeks ago. A freescale semiconductor who were uh, based up in Silicon Glen, as it was then called, near Glasgow. Uh, and this freescale, they had factories all over the world, but they had one factory in Kilbride in Glasgow. And we helped them several different projects. Um, and it was, and it always went really well. We'd go and do a couple of days of you know, workshop or whatever, or maybe you know, a day and a half of, of workshop, helping them to grapple with uh, things they were stuck with. And the, the, the first time we went, they were in the middle of a, of a reorganisation that McKinsey's, McKinsey's had been there before us, you know, charging a lot of money to somebody. And McKinsey's had told them where, what they needed to do, but not how to do it or how to engage people. So McKinsey's took their quarter of a million pound fee or whatever it was and, and departed 
and, uh, uh, and and they're left with this kind of here's what you need to do, but nothing about how to do it. And so we, we came and did uh, a workshop about how to do it. And in two days with us, they they basically had a plan. Um, and uh, you know, of course, they'd done a lot of thinking about it beforehand. But solution focus really helped to open it up to ways they could move forward on the thing they'd been kind of told to do, but not told how to do. Mm. And very satisfying work, and they are really nice, nice people. In a, you know, and um, uh, they 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 engaged with it in a really committed way. And uh, so it was. It was very, very um, exciting work, and and very, very worthwhile. Even though, and they they paid us a tiny fraction of what somebody must have paid McKinsey's to do it. And uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, of course, you know, these the, the free scale don't be, uh, that factory is closed now, but not because of what we did. <laughs> 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 if anyone goes to look for a free scale in East Gilbride, you'll not, I think you won't find them. But, um, uh, you know, but that, this was more than 10 years ago. But then we had a series of interviews with them that were really interesting. Mm. Uh, another thing we did was we worked with the Nationwide Building Society uh, over a period to help them redo their um, performance appraisal scheme. Um, uh, their kind of, you know, this annual review sort of process mm -hmm. and um, uh, we, we helped uh, to them to develop a new system which wasn't completely solution focused but it had a lot more of solution focus about it and getting them to start with what's gone well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way of summing it up. An appraisal interview very often starts with what's gone badly. <laughs> that's the kind of natural <laughs> and he's nodding away there. You know, it's the natural way of telling you, well, now let's look at what happened last year. Well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And you failed at the other. And of course, if the manager starts by talking what's gone badly, then the person can respond, well, I wasn't that bad. And immediately you have an argument. Yep. You know, that's a natural response. Whereas if you start with what's gone well, you start with agreement and nodding and yes, that's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it just gets the whole it's the difference between solution focus and problem focus. It gets the whole thing off to a, to a different start. And then, of course, you come to the things that didn't go so well, but you do them in the context of the things that did go well and in the context more of the person's strengths and skills and uh, resources. And then also you get them focusing on small steps uh, and you get them focusing on more frequent conversations. Hmm. Part of the difficulty with that sort of system is, you know, often it's kept as a once a year thing and that's that's much, much too infrequent because hmm. the, all grievances get stored up and then you end up with a, uh, with a thing that nobody's looking forward to and isn't going to be very productive. So trying to hmm. encourage people more regular checking in and, and making it uh, and starting with what works and using things like scales um, uh, and um, focusing on the things that the person's done really really well to start with and then moving down the kind of performance the ladder from there um, but it makes a huge difference and anyway. so um I'm I'm also intrigued in your in your early days. You you um, I see you as one of the galvanizing forces in bringing together the network of solution focused practitioners around the world, um, in particular in the under the auspices of Soul World and the and the Soul World activity. And, am I right? Were you involved in organising the very first Soul World Absolutely. conference in Bristol? More than that, I was involved in the discussion in the pub. That was the. <laughs> <laughs> So you go to the pub. another great story. So tell us about the pub. <laughs> in Bristol, which is a very ancient pub, it's a 16th century pub, um, and there ought to be a table with a plaque on it saying the Bristol Solutions Group decided to do soul here, uh, but there isn't, unfortunately. But um, the Bristol Solutions Group uh, existed uh, from 1994, uh, started by me and Harry Mormon, uh, not Harry Coleman. Uh, Harry Norman, who was the Bristolian uh, councillor 
and a hypnotherapist and, and billions around, although less involved. And um, he, I, we met at a brief event in 1993 and decided to start the Bristol Solutions for anyone who's interested in food. And the first meeting was in our living room, me and Jenny, on the 1st of April, 1994. And it expanded, it went from being a public meeting to being a kind of supervision group. And then it became a, a closed supervision group. And we were thinking about what do we want to do as a group. And Paul and I were writing. Paul Jackson was a member. I was a member. Harry, Jenny, uh, Kate Hart, uh, John Hendon was a member who's still very much around. Uh, Ron Banks was involved. And the group of us thought, what can we do? Paul said, Paul and I said, we're writing this book. Let's have a meeting for anyone who's interested in solution focus with, with organisations to celebrate the publication of it. And they all said, all right, fine, let's do that. And so that was 2000. Uh, at the end of 2000, we had that conversation. The first Soul World Conference, Soul 2002, came in February 2002 in Bristol. And uh, it was, we were expecting about 25 people to show up, but 80 people booked. And mm. they booked all over the world. And so fortunately, we had a room that could be expanded in a hotel. <laughs> on the uh, uh, and we had the event and we, we ran it as well as we knew how to run a conference and that's drawing on all these things from the accelerated learning world about uh, flexibility and variety and engagement and different sorts of sessions and chances to meet in different science groups and um, we did the first one and I was expecting everyone to say right let's do another one but they weren't, so I called the meeting in the pub and said, "Let's. Do, what are we going to do now? And they said, let's do it again. So we did. So we did the first two, and that set the tone. And then other people began to pick it up. So the group in Stockholm ran it in the 2004, group in uh, Switzerland, Peter Zabo's group in 2005, uh, Gunther Loewe and hans Korn in Vienna in 2006, uh, Bruges in Belgium in 2007, and uh, it go, that group goes on, and uh, it's been a it's been an amazing thing to keep it going in very minimal ways because we have a strange organisational model with Soul World. We don't have a, a committee, we don't have a bank account, we don't have anyone responsible for anything. Uh, <laughs> But what we do is we support people who want to do Soul World events. And so if people say, oh, I want to run a conference, we say, fine. Or occasionally we say, are you sure? <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, and, and so this network, you know, it gives its name to events that people want to put on. And that's not just conferences. We've had summer retreats for many years now. We've had different sorts of things. We used to have summer universities years ago. Now, anyone can organize a whole world event if you can get the backing of the steering group, which is about 40 or 50 people, and anyone who wants a steering group can be on it. <laughs> so it's all, very, it's all very uncompetitive. The secret, actually, is, to tell you, is to keep money out of it. The steering group has no money, and we don't want any money, because as soon as you have money, you need probity and official reporting, uh, which then makes everything official. Mm. Uh, and if you don't have money, then, then the, you know, the restrictions are very small. So mm. Soul World has been an amazing thing, and it's still going. We still have our email discussion list, Soul World list, uh, which is open to join people who want to talk about solution-focused work in organizations. Um, that's changed a couple of times, but we have archived every single message since... <coughs> It, I set it up in late 2000. Um, wow. uh, and, you know, the, these things all need keeping going behind the scenes. Some people don't realise that there's work in keeping things like that going. And it's not very visible work. And we don't shout about it a lot. But, mm. but it, I spend some of my time making sure those things work. Mm. And the, the communication channels are open. Once I'm sure that the communication channels are open, then I'm less fussed about what we said on them. The main thing for me is, is, to, is to, um, to make sure that it's possible for people to say things 
and other people can hear them. Mm. Wicked. So there's um, you've got a new book coming out soon, Mark. We see yes. you scrolling along the bottom. It sounds uh, sounds fascinating. The next well, generation solution focused practice. Yes, it's a bold title, isn't it? And um, it stems from Ooh. a paper I wrote three years ago now called SFBT 2.0, which some people may have read. And I, it resulted from me going to a conference in South Africa, which is a very good conference, and a solution focused conference. And it, and, but it became very clear that, there, that some people were doing solution focused as if it was 1990, and other people were doing it as if it was 2017. Mm. And there was an increasing divergence in what that meant. And uh, some of the folk, Brief particularly, but others, Elliot, Connie, um, Adam Freuer, were kind of embracing this, this much more description-based view of the work, uh, whereas other people were kind of still doing very much Steve DeShazer and Intu Kimberg right at the beginning in Milwaukee kind of work. And uh, I'm not saying that we don't know yet whether one is better than the other in terms of being more effective, but they're different. Mm. Uh, and I wrote this paper to try and point that point to the differences. Say, look, if we're trying to research solution focused work, we should be a bit clear about is it this version or this version? You can see my hands on the thing there. Yeah, this version <laughs> or this version. Uh, because if we're trying to lump it all together, we're not doing ourselves any favors. These things are now different enough that we need to start thinking about these versions and the big difference comes into what is the practitioner trying to do at the beginning mm. now if you go back to milwaukee 1988 it's very clear that the practitioner was trying to devise an intervention mm. and the interview was to so that the practitioner and the team behind the mirror could devise an intervention to give to the client. Mm. They may or may not do it, but the idea was to devise an intervention that you would give. Mm. And that continued, but the intervention started to become less important and, and, uh, and, and things moved along. And then when we come to the kind of brief type description method, that's, not, that's explicitly now done in their terms without an intervention. Or rather, the conversation is the intervention, and there's no end of session. We'd like you to do this thing. Mm. And so, in the, the the newer version, the therapist's objective is not to design an intervention; it is to get the client to describe what better means and looks like, so that they have more clue for themselves what to do. Mm. And I think those two things are different enough; they shouldn't be muddled. And we should be exploring more the, the later one because it's simpler and it's more elegant and it, and it involves taking less power from the client. And these are all things that I think were priorities for Stephen Insu and the Brief Family Therapy Centre people. But they were, they were doing it coming out of a world which was you know, where even problem-focused brief therapy was, was radical and new. And so it's not surprising that these things move on. And uh, I, I, I'm not really not trying to diss the, the, the people who did the first thing. I'm saying that I think we've learned more now and we can go even further down the road that they were pointing down. Mm. Um, so the book is The Next Generation of Solution Focused Practice, as I say, bold title. And it takes solution focused work from the 1920s. Uh, with Gregory Bateson, uh, up to now and beyond, showing the development of it through the decades. Mm. And so I'm not presenting this thing as a new thing that, that, that is different to the old things. I'm presenting the whole thing as a sweep, a sweep through decades of work, showing how things evolved and emerged. And so I, mean, I hope that these, these things that, that are now people are now talking about, this idea of building descriptions with the client as being the first priority, mm. uh, as, uh, as an extension, this is an extension of things that were nascent decades ago, 
but are now becoming clearer because we learn as we go. Mm. Wow. Um, and, and I guess um, an illustration of the development of thinking that's gone into the latest book would be, of course, another one of your books, the many books that you've written. Um, this this one I'm pleased to say is my is my my signed copy, Mark, from 2014. Um, the, the idea of the leader as host rather than the leader as commander and direction setter, the leader as host intervening when an intervention is required, stepping back and allowing progress to be made when appropriate, and so many different aspects that you and your co-author Helen Bailey have brought to that as well. And I know, of course, in your inimitable style, that has resulted now in conferences and further discussion groups and a follow-up book. And, and you know, um, where does that fit into your solution-focused canon and the development of the practice? That's a really interesting question, Andrew. I, so I think um, solution-focused therapists have always hosted their therapeutic conversations. Hosting is where you invite people in with a welcoming hand, and you try to sh and you share power with your clients. And so, you, if your client can do things for themselves, you encourage them to do it. If they want want or need support, you can offer it. Um, but the host a host guest relationship is a really interesting one, and it's not the same as a kind of master servant relationship or a hero and, and saved person relationship. It's kind of, it's, it's, a host is both above their guests and below them. The host is clearly in charge when you welcome guests. It's up to you to provide things and look after things and stuff. But the host is also there to serve the guest and make sure they feel welcome and they have what they need. And so it's a kind of paradoxical above and below relationship. And I feel solution-focused practitioners are very good at that. Maybe we don't talk about it in those terms. But solution focus is fundamentally about addressing the power differential between the practitioner and the client. And you can't remove it, but you can redress it and you can think about it in different ways. Uh, and uh, I think Steve and Insu were very interested in this, although they didn't talk about it overtly very often. Uh, this idea that that you get away from the professional as the one who says what happens. And it's a much more participative, collaborative uh, uh, process where both people bring something uh, and both people, um, uh, you know, get changed by it. Uh, so, I, so, so I think that we, we host our clients and, and it feels to me like the way that I've worked through my life with, um, with setting up Soul World. That's a hosting job and keeping it going behind the scenes and nudging it along when it needs to be, to be nudged and letting it run when it needs to be, when it doesn't need nudging and it's running. You know, I think that's a hosting role and anyone's welcome at Soul World as long as they, uh, you know, want to join in in a constructive way. And the ones who turn up wanting to peddle their own, you know, trademarked version of consultancy, uh, don't tend to come back mysteriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's a kind of it's kind of gentle thing, but it's um, uh, but and it, and it's very easy to miss because good hosts don't step to the front very often. They do occasionally, but it, but it, you know if everything's going along well, you don't see the host very much. If it starts to go off the rails, you probably do see them a bit more. But you're often a lot behind the scenes and just nudging things along and joining in with it. Mm. So, and I, I heard about uh, host hosting and was inspired at the second ever Soul World conference in 2003, where uh, Matthias Varga von Kibet, some some of the viewers may know Matthias Varga, marvelous man, uh, does systemic structural constellations and was a great friend of Steve Deshazes very interested in solution-focused work. He was doing a workshop about hosting constellations, and he said, there's an old Arabic proverb. He said, the host is both the first and the last. The host is both the first and the last. And I thought, that's the leader, isn't it? <laughs> you know, the leader has to go first to show the way, but also the leader goes last to make sure everyone's coming along with them. 
And so the first and the last can be as anything from the first into the room to set it up and the last one out, having cleared up and turned the lights out. Or it can be a much more philosophical alpha and omega, um, bringing together all kinds of things. And so I immediately stopped listening to his workshop and went, started scribbling in my notebook. And um, the result nearly a decade later was this book, Host. And um, it's, a, it's kind of quite high level. And so we were working on developing some more practical things. And that's where, in part anyway, the subsequent collection, the Host Leadership Fieldbook, comes in, uh, which has got its experience from 30 people around the world using the ideas from the first book in practice. And there's different things there. And we're still collecting. I'd like to do a Host Leadership um, handbook or something like that in a year or two with, uh, you know, with some more practical things. Because people love the idea, but we're still working out there's so many ways to put it into practice. And so I don't want to be saying you've got to do it this way and this way and this way. But at the same time, there are definitely some ways that seem to work better than others. So we're kind of still working on that. And that conversation is very open. Anyone who'd like to join in with that, go to hostle excuse me, hostleadership.com. Come and join the conversation. And so there's a LinkedIn group as well and a Facebook group about that topic. And we're planning a gathering in Vienna next June, just before the Soul World Conference. Same place, same uh, organizers, uh, all of the same people, I think. It's fingers crossed that we're all, we are allowed to go, but if it doesn't happen, we'll do something else. But, uh, mm. So that's all that's work I'm still very, very uh, engaged with and uh, uh, taking, taking forward and um, these things take a while to get going. It's the other thing I've, I've learned. In the in this field of management and people, stuff takes a while to catch on. Mm. Uh, and in physics, where I came from, if you know, if you make a new discovery, everyone picks it up instantly. But uh, management uh, and social sciences don't work like that. So. Mm. <laughs> mm. so we've um, obviously we've met so many wonderful uh, people during lockdown and doing these chats and how how many different areas the solution focus approach is, is being worked in now out, outside you know outside of the family therapy uh, origins and everywhere else do you, is it why do you think it's i mean where is it not being taken up so much where it could really help but somehow we're not kind of do you know what I mean? It's not as mainstream as it should be because it's such a, a wonderful way well, of working. I'll tell you why I think it's not as mainstream as it should be. Um, I think it's because professionals don't like giving away that much power. Mm. I think that's what it comes to. You, you need to have a certain ability and desire to trust your client mm. at some level. And I have seen so many cases of kind of negative professionals who the client is seems to me clearly ready to take a step and the professionals urging them against it because they don't for the best of intentions statedly that they don't want the client to be disappointed with themselves and they don't want the client to fail but if you if your version of that is to urge them not to do something then i think you're in the wrong game so and my experience is that not every professional the professionals like to be in charge of things and this requires quite a lot of letting go of that and or being in charge of it in a sort of in a herding cats type of a way rather than a standing there with a megaphone type of way <laughs> um you know so so it's a different way of wanting to work with people and you have to want them not to look at you all the time mm. you have to want to look at them to look at themselves and to look at uh, each other Mm. Um, sorry, go on, Mark. Well, so I think, and it's not just in management that happens, you know, it happens in all sorts of professions. So I think that's why it hasn't caught on. But the, way, the reason it has caught on in so many fields is I think it's tapping into the way people are. And I think, and then this is part of the, the, what's coming into the next book, The Next Generation of Solution Focused Practice, is that I talk about solution focus stretching the world of the client. Mm. 
the client world is expanded and different. And the world is everything that you could interact with. Mm. So it's you and the things you can interact with. And if you have more possibilities for interacting with things that are connected with better, it, it's not just you that's different, it's the world that's different. Mm. Um, and I take a chapter in the book to unpack, and there's a unpack the sort of philosophy of mind of this. Mm. And there's a whole load of post Wittgensteinian inactive cognition work that's going along in the last 10 years that's really got some momentum in in the philosophy circles which is steve de Chazer, if he was with us would be would be really really interested in um and it and it's kind of offering new ways to look at some of those wittgensteinian ideas but in a much more precise and useful uh, way so as i say this doesn't replace what we've done before but it, i think it uses what's known now to uh, to expand on that mm -hmm. and, and there's something about when you ask people about tiny signs that things are better you sort of get them into this zone of thinking about the possible and the possible that's close mm -hmm. um, uh, and i think that uh, as i say i said the meaning you do we used to do this problem to solution to exercise and in two minutes people are feeling different and i think that it's it's that kind of, it's so visceral it's mm. so embedded it's so much to do with how we are as people and how we make sense of the world that i think that it's it's kind of going with nature yeah. you, know, you go with nature mm. and how people are and you don't go against them and i think that's why it, it taps in in so many fields uh, it's just coming to do with how we are as people and our natural abilities as people. Yeah, to, to problem solve, because that's what we've done oh, through oh, generations. To help, to elbow people out of the way, to tell them mm. what we think, to, um, you know, to, to, and there's, not, there's nothing wrong with telling people what you think and, and the, the teaching and, and is, is vital. Um, mm. but, but, if, but if it's also to do with the way you think about mental illness, Mm. And, um, and and solution focus offers a completely different way of thinking about mental illness than anything, almost anything else, mm. uh, which is which is to to ignore ignore the label, to turn so move from the label to the personal, and move from the what's wrong with you to what you want, mm. uh, and move from the what you want to what's working, and how can you move forward on it now. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and there are so many steps in that that the, mm. the, 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 the conventional mental health, mental illness thinking, you know, says it's very important to work out what what makes you depressed. No, it's not. <laughs> it's absolutely useless to know what makes you depressed. What makes you not? What makes you more of the thing you want to be is incredibly more useful, and we can get to it without knowing anything about what depression is at all. Yeah. So. Um, and of course, there are these arguments about is depression to do with a chemical imbalance in the brain or something, to which the answer is no, even if you can show sometimes, sometimes that there are. Um, uh, there's, there's so much confusion about this that steps over. Mm. You know, and I, I, I personally would like to see more people taking on the mental, the mental illness professionals about this. But it does get you deep into struggle and strife. And I know that it's easier to just go do it, just do our thing and we can work with our client and in the end they'll come round. And I, I thought 30 years ago they would come round and I'm really not sure now. That's why I've written mm -hmm. this new, which offers this, this new picture of what, what it means, you know, what does mental illness mean in terms of an imbalance, imbalance in the client's world and how does solution focus help to redress or reattune uh, that um, that balance, and I do a whole new definition of mental illness in the book, oh, wow. just just to you know, just the icing on the cake. Um, <laughs> whole mental illness in terms of an active cognition, and it's about a and it's about an out, unpleasant out of tuneness of the person with their immediate environment, mm. uh, uh, and and how solution focus brings it into balance again uh, in a in, in an interesting and effective way. I can't wait for that to come out.
because I uh, I don't know if you saw um, we had uh, Rachel Gillibrand um, doing some um, mapping of the of the brain while being asked solution focused questions and how how the creativity lit up. Yep. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure it does, but that doesn't mean that solution focused is you know the brain the brain is the be all and end all. I think this is. Mm. The great distractions of today the brain has become you know a kind of focus of attention um mm. i call them the neuro fetishists sometimes <laughs> uh, <laughs> the brain's responsible for everything of course the brain has a role but but all sorts of other things have roles in it as well i did a, a paper in 2006 about heart coherence you, I, I'll put a link somewhere in the, in, in the chat afterwards. Um, you can measure the coherence of your heartbeat. In other words, how smoothly is it varying? And, uh, uh, and a coherent heart stacks up to a good state, basically. And I did um, this. Uh, we did an experiment at a conference where I asked solution-focused questions to someone who was wired up to a heart monitor to measure their heart coherence. And as they talked about the day after the miracle, their coherence went up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Quite, mm. quite extraordinary. So, so you know, and this is what I mean by it, it works with. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to know anything about the heart to do that. Mm. It just, likewise, I suspect um, the brain response the same. You don't need to know anything about the brain. It's because we're working with the grain of humanity yeah. that that's that that's happening. We, we have a question from Mark, Matt. Um, shall I read it out? How would you approach a coaching or mediation style situation where there are issues within a team with some not enthusiastic to participate? How does solution focus fit and how would you start? Oh, yeah. Well, so this is that's a great question. Thank you, Mark. Um, so platform building. Uh, it's always the start. What are we talking about? And the difference between the solutions focus book 20 years ago and where I am now is that I used to think platform building was really easy uh, and kind of you could get it done quickly and move on to the more sexy, interesting parts like miracle questions and scale. But now I think that actually it's a very subtle business. And sometimes it's very easy, but other times you have to put a lot of work in. And, uh, and so, the situation, the kind of situation that Mark is pointing to, where there are some people enthusiastic and some not, um, it's the platform building is the piece that starts to work with that, which is to do with what do you want? What are you hoping for? What are your best hopes, perhaps? <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and doing that, that's part of the work. It's a key part of the work. It sounds like a precursor. But you... you and you negotiate something that everyone or most people want. Mm. Because if you can negotiate that, then with the rest of it should be fairly straightforward. Fairly straightforward. Mm. Whereas if you, if you really have some people want this and some people want diametrically opposite, then you have a different sort of situation. And there are then choices about well, either we're going to work with work with one lot um or we're going to keep going on the platform i think jenny did jenny mention the red red working with the green people when she was on the program mm -hmm. she does maybe not no so this is a, a model that's in the solutions focus book but it's not original to us um of thinking about people in terms of green amber and red and uh, the green people are very keen on the thing that, that you know to move towards something and they're really up for it the amber people are kind of, nah, maybe, not sure, sitting on the fence, you know, uh, we'll see. And the red people are, are the are never, not on, not on your life, not over my dead body sort of people. Now, organisational change, you get this all the time. Uh, at the of any project, there are going to be some people in those camps. But, of course, the important thing is not to label them as that. Um, but the way to start, we always tell people, start working with the green ones while make, keeping up invitations to everybody to get involved, start working with the green ones. And when you do, things begin to develop, some of the amber people will think, oh, just a minute, this project is actually going to happen. 
perhaps we better get interested. Oh, she did, she did, she did, she did. Oh, I love it. Yes, I like this. Sorry, Karen, Karen. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm, if you're watching, I was listening to you. It was Joe that wasn't yeah. listening. I was listening. And um, uh, so, so, so more and more of the amber people become green, and then some of the red people will come over as well. And there may be a few people left behind. And the metaphor is like you're all standing on the platform and the train's sort of sat there, and then the train starts to move. And it's the action of the train starting to move that makes the amber people feel that they now have to make a decision. And all the time you sit there with the train stationary while you argue with the red people, nothing's happening. <laughs> so, so if you try and get everybody on board right at the start, it will take you ages and it will be very frustrating. Whereas if you get work with people who are on board already while ushering the other ones to get involved, the, 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 the beginning of the process will encourage many of them to join in. Um, but I would, to come back to Mark's question, and I've worked with that sort of situation a lot, and I always try and fashion a statement of a platform that everyone can kind of nod to. You know, what's the thing we want to deal with? Or what's the thing we want here? And it might be very vague. I once I, I did a did a thing in uh, between a uh, to, uh, a team and a manager who came from teams with very different cultures, and the team were very consensual, and the manager was very direct, and they didn't get on. And uh, but we but we you know, we ended up with a platform that was statement that was uh, just we want to find a way to work better together. Everyone could sign up for that, even if they had rather different ideas at the outset of what that would entail. We all wanted to find a way to work better together. And that's enough to get people in a room and start. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, if you, and if everyone is sat around at the beginning saying, yes, we all want the same thing, even if we're not sure what that means yet, you, you're on to, you know, it's a good start. And then with the usual solution-focused processes, then begin to kind of draw things out and, uh, and produce some interesting stuff. Um, Mark, I think we get the clock, there's just a couple of minutes to go. I think it's only fair, you give so much to the community. I think it's time we give you the chance just to say, if people want to engage with you, to train with you, I know you've been training people around the world online for years and years and years, and the rest of us have finally caught up with uh, that technique. How do we find more about the training courses you're offering and how do people engage with you and, and your books and everything else that you're bringing so they can learn more from you? So the, my main website for solution-focused stuff is sfwork.com. Uh, and uh, if you go, so there's there, there's loads of stuff. If you go to the section that's called Changing and then Learning SF, you will find uh, a link uh, a link, a rather well hidden link to the online <laughs> SF. Um, you have to click on the title rather than I, I, I have a look at that. It could be easier. <laughs> but, um, the, the online course that I do is run in cahoots with the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and um, of course, this is where Stephen Insu used to run their online courses when they were alive. And I was very, very honoured when uh, they wanted to do. Stephen Insu and then Harry Coleman for a while and now Peter de Jong run the therapy course and they said we wanted a business course, an organisational course as well, would you run it? And I was very, very honoured to be invited to be the one who did that in that place. So that programme is 16 weeks online, you get a certificate from the university and it's going to be redesigned over the winter to bring in all the stuff from the new book. So. Um, uh, so that that's going to be very very exciting, and I'm going to be working hard on redoing, uh, adding in all those uh, new elements, really making sure that that's that's there. And uh, we have small groups, usually about eight or ten or twelve, very intensive work, and everyone comes away uh, highly skilled, but also very connected to their colleagues. Uh, and some of the some of the greatest members of our community have kind of gone through that route so that's what i'm doing in terms of online training but on that sf work site you can also click on articles and books uh, and you'll find all the articles there or the, i think most of them mm -hmm. um, there's also the archives of the interaction journal which i was one of the editors of for eight years um from 19 uh, 2009 to 2016 Every paper from 16 issues of that journal is on the site, free to download. 
uh, as well as stuff about my accelerated learning and uh, links to host leadership. So that's the place to start. Mm. Brilliant. Well, and you're when, a one stop shop. Yeah, I don't know where you find the Sorry. time. Mark. Well, I've got, can I just tell you about my? Can I tell you about my new thing then? Just Please. in the last, which is no, which, well, it's a solution, folks. It's it's called Village in the City, and it's my uh, post-COVID build forward better project. Um, I noticed that in my street here in Edinburgh, in the lockdown, people started talking to each other and supporting each other in a way that they hadn't before. And I thought my life is improved by this. Uh, and I want to build my local community, my village in the city. And I want to encourage other people to do the same. Uh, and so I set up in June, village in the city. And we are developing a community of people who want to build their own micro local communities, as I call them, might only be a few streets. Uh, where there hasn't been community in the past to kind of tap into the COVID cooperation to build on it and extend it. And of course, I'm using solution focused methods, although I don't announce that very loudly uh, in, uh, you know, often in that thing. But it, you'll find it's, it's very much about bringing people together as a host uh, who are interested to do this and we can all learn together. So that's online at villageinthecity.net, villageinthecity.net. We have monthly calls with special guests. We just had one this afternoon. And it's a very it's a nascent project. It's gathering a little momentum. I'm not quite sure where it's going to go, but it feels like it brings together um, a lot of things that I've done over the years. So solution focus is very useful. Host leadership, it's, it's a hosting job to make a community or help to develop a community. Uh, and it's something to want to do it from the bottom up and share the power and get people doing it for themselves rather than me kind of telling exactly what to do. So villageinthecity.net is my latest, as if I had not, not enough. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> so check that out. I think if you're keen on uh, making your life better by making your, your, very, your local community better, uh, that would be Wow. Brilliant. Wow. wow. Already. <laughs> Guys. Hour. It's gone. It's we could That's we could honestly, honestly spend about you know a whole day talking about this because I just think you're such an interesting guy. Mm. Well, thank you. It's been it's been really a great pleasure and privilege to be able to pontificate for. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and as now. soon as the book's published, we want you back on so we can actually disclose yeah. a little bit more info. That would be great. Yeah. Um, any last questions or comments from the co-hosts? Um, just thank you for inviting me to join in as a co-host tonight, uh, Aish and Joe, and it's great to see you again, Mark, and uh, I've loved this conversation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for the series you guys are putting together as well. This is a tremendous resource, all these interviews and conversations. It's wonderful. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you both so much for joining us. We feel uh, humbled, uh, and it's uh, like, like um, Andrew was saying, it's fascinating. Um, and I can't wait for the book to come out because um, we we done some recent sort of had to do a history of the SF approach recently for a course we were on, and I found it really fascinating. So I'm I'm really looking forward to your that book signed yeah. copy, please, Mark. Yeah, Thank Mark, you. come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, if Andrew's got one, uh, well, it's, it's not out not out of April next year. Uh, this is this is the oh. yeah. Well, we, that's all right. We, I, by, by then, we can travel up to you, and you, I, we can buy the book, travel up to you, and just kind of stand up the door and go, and Mark, yeah. Mark. Well, no doubt there'll be a UK SFP conference or something like that that we can all. Yeah. Hopefully, we. Yeah. Let's all let's all go to Vienna. Let's all put that in the diary and go to Vienna and. Vienna. Uh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. Followed by the Soul World Conference. It's in early June uh, next year, and if you if you want to Google around. Uh, uh, those things you'll find that more positive. Well, it's yeah, a, I mean, a classic piece of it's a classic piece of uh, of hosting, an example of what you give to the community, Mark. That you've organised those two conferences back to back, put them in the diary, and said, "Come on, guys, let's get this organised. Let's get this done." Because uh, uh, friends Ralph, Ralph Miarka and Veronica Cotterer in Vienna have quite a lot to do with it as well. They're very, very good, uh, good people. 
uh, so so that we've already got a number of people you know booking uh, booking up for post leadership of course it's all fingers crossed we can actually yeah. we can actually do it and get mark, together mark can you send us the link so we can book on and put the dates in our diary um to if you send it to our emails because you know joe and i are so busy of course <laughs> <laughs> so fabulously busy that you know we need to know at least a year in advance what we're doing um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, send it. if you can email me then because um, honestly it's, it's something that we've both wanted to attend and now's the opportunity for us to kind of save up mm. and kind of get there but that's brilliant and yeah, yeah, well, well, too, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll nice. even buy you a coffee both of you <laughs> We travel together and get a coffee and a cake and, and a cake. cake. And not have cake. No, no, definitely. But you've, right, you've both you been, then. yeah. You please then. do, Mark. Um, and you've you've both been absolutely wonderful. And I was doing the admin in the background, as Joe says, <laughs> that I've been doing. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely have you back on again. Um, honestly, you're absolutely incredible. We learn so much from every person that we meet on here or, or talk to on here, and we're definitely inspiring. To hear everything that you're doing, that you've done, is, is absolutely inspiring. Um, so thank you very much for being you, both of you. Oh, it's the only thing I can do. Oh, <laughs> fabulous. Um, can I ask you both to just stay there so we can have a very quick conversation afterwards? And for everyone else, mm -hmm. tomorrow, 11 a.m., we are having a conversation with the local Nexus team to see how they're supporting young people in the community. And I know how hard mm -hmm. they are working. They are brilliant. So tomorrow, 11 a.m. Uh, on FBS Chat, let's show off all the fantastic work that we're doing locally. Take care, everyone.